ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Rumi Kosea, president of Japan Center for Conflict Prevention, JCCP. We can start the session. Is the translation interpretation ready? Yes, we are more than ready. Um, JCCP works in Middle East and Africa in the area of women's and youth empowerment, and we, including a training youth and women in conflict management, mediation, social cohesion. And we have been working in Turkey for the last four years in supporting uh, Syrian refugees in the area of protection, psychosocial, legal support, and so on. So, so in this session, um, when we talk about leaving no one behind in migration and displacement, we need to bear in mind that uh, there are a group of people who need special attention with specific needs, which are women and youth. Uh, in the context of migration, and in particular, in the context of forced displacement, women face multiple challenges, for example, in the form of becoming female head of household because of the loss of their husband or male head of household, and also the women and girls are subject to um, sexual and gender-based violence, and women and girls are affected by early marriage or forced marriage due to a lack of livelihood. And at the same time, youth who have limited economic and social opportunities are also vulnerable to recruitment to illegal or violent groups and activities. Uh, however, women and youth should not only be seen as being subject to protection or victimization, but also seen as actors to bring positive changes in the society. As articulated in UN Security Council Resolution 1325, Women, Peace and Security, as well as a Resolution 2250, Youth, Peace and Security. For example, by revitalizing underrepresented expertise and role of women and youth in migration and displacement, it could bring positive transformation to the host community as well as to the civil societies. So in this session, the key questions to the distinguished speakers could be how your municipality or your agency promote gender equality and respond to the specific needs of refugee and migrant youth and women with good practice and specific example. So now I would like to invite first speaker, Mr. Ruslan Marchinkiv, the mayor of ivano Frankiv, Ukraine. The floor is yours. And you have a, it was supposed to be eight minutes, but apparently we only have six minutes each now. Hello. <coughs> Uh, my city is in Western Ukraine, uh, a young European city with a great history, active development and internable desire for positive changes. Uh, it's small information about our city and our decisions. Uh, some words about uh, migrants. We have 4,000 migrants from Donbass uh, region and 1,000 approximately from Arabic uh, countries and Africa. Uh, some words about gender budgeting. There are near 14,000 entrepreneurs in ivano Frankiv city. 80% uh, of them entrepreneurs or small and medium entrepreneurship, including more than 57% women and 107 uh, entrepreneurs by migrants. In order to conduct gender analysis in ivano Frankiv city, we choose the program in promotional area of small and medium entrepreneurship development. Uh, this is the program of increasing competitiveness of small and medium entrepreneurship in Ivano-Frankiv city. 
program arrangements were analyzed in the following way, whether program arrangements are available equally for men and women, whether program services meet customers' requirements, both males and females. Uh, creating program budgetary passport for further programs is implemented in response to recommendations by gender policy oriented budgeting that has been defined in Ukraine since January uh, 2019 at the legislative level. Uh, women's entrepreneurship. Program of increasing competitiveness of small and medium entrepreneurship in Ivano Frankivsk is working in order to create favorable terms for business in Ivano Frankivsk. The program was developed in cooperation with experts of Ukrainian Canadian Project Partnership for Local Economic Development and Democracy uh, Governance. Uh, that is Im implementing in Ukraine by Federation of Canadian Municipalities with financial support from Canadian government. Uh, city, uh, several economical important documents for cities' development have been implemented with the help of PDG, such as city development strategy, program of increasing competi uh, competitiveness of small and medium entrepreneurship in ivano Frankisk, marketing strategy, city brand. Uh, one of the most important goals of the program is women's entrepreneurship development that forces set of arrangements increasing women's opportunities for creating and improving their own businesses. Special attention is paid to organization of workshops, roundtable discussions, training courses for small and medium businesses and providing financial support for first-time entrepreneurs based on startups contest. For instance, we have co-financed uh, B2B Creative Women Network, increasing women's opportunities in creative industries in ivano Frankis project. It forces creating of accelerator supporting center of creative women's startups in a role of institutions that will forward these startups market introduction, introduction and will push to creative business initi initiations, realization, special training course, and mentor program implementing. As a, result, as a result, there will be realization of interesting startups and a range of cooperation network among women and creative industries, even, even within the country, because mentors are famous people from each in industry. There is also realization of investment literacy for women and success in business projects aimed at women's entrepreneurship support. This project plans to train women of practical skills how to start and run the business. Some words about municipal improvement according to gender expert. In the process of creating municipal improvement objects and streets reconstruction, we take into account special women's needs in the view of women's heels. Smooth, seamless kind of pavings are picked for comfortable working on heels. And some words about, migra about migrants. It's uh, our statistic but uh, really statistic uh, is uh, grow. In uh, 2014, Ukraine became a victim of military aggression by the Russian Federation in Crimea and Donbass. As a result of military aggression, according to Uniform Information Database of Internally uh, Displaced Persons as of November uh, 18, 29, 1,040,022 people displaced persons from temporary occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions and Crimea have been reg registered. On November 2019 in ivano Frankivsk, 2,241 uh, internally displaced persons have been registered, but um, many uh, people uh, don't register in our social uh, departments. Uh, including 1,335 uh, able-bodied persons, uh, 596 children, uh, 96 persons with dis disabilities, and uh, four, uh, 414 pensioners. And on November uh, 29, uh, 429 families that live in Ivano Frankis get monthly touched financial help. 
Uh, in general, we have implemented payments in the amount of uh, 7 million grivnas during this year. Uh, it's a small presentation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for the comprehensive presentation, including your practical example of gender budgeting, contributing to women, female-friendly infrastructure, and also the, your assistance to the conflict-related IDPs and affected population women and youth. Now, I would like to invite the next, next speaker, Mr. Umer Arisoy, the mayor of Daitinburu municipality. Oh, sorry, um, the next speaker is Mr. Ari Khalife, sorry, the mayor of Sarafan municipality, Lebanon. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me have my introduce in Arabic, which is my country's language, including the conference where a group of languages participated may be offered to the attention of all nations on the migration burning. Thank you. Uh, their purpose was just to escape death, but then they became mere numbers in displayed records. Oh, excuse me, the speaker will... Before beginning my speech, I would like to extend my thanks to the organizers of this forum and And especially the problems, I would like to extend my thanks to all those who put effort to solve the problems of the refugees in my country. Sarafan municipality and UN agencies supported us significantly. That is to say, rather than giving a fish, they taught us how to, they teach us how to catch fish. And this is exactly what we do. Mm. We have started to establish three organizations, institutions to support the refugees and migrants, and also to support host communities, so that when the migrants and the refugees go back to their home, these organizations and institutions will remain to support the households, families in need. Some of our most significant projects we conducted are will be serving the host community so that many of the problems of the host communities and the refugees will be solved with these three institutions. So these Syrian refugees are doing this, this migration to save their lives, and they started to appear on the news. And many people started to talk bad things about them, and the artists and the poets started to cover it in their works. Some people are still living in tents, and they are working in harsh conditions, and they have difficult and tough days. Some institutions and organizations have been to there, and they have taken photographs of hungry children of these families to promote their assistances. And they were given international awards for their assistance because they marketed this tragedy. This is a terrible experience. Many of the Syrian refugees, because the Palestinian refugees had the same sufferings, because some people And many of the political parties used it as a tool for their political inspirations, and they have become objects of politics. Distinguished colleagues, be it a man or a woman in Syria, they have dreams very much like us. Their children's dreams are as valuable as ours. A child at the age of seven had a banner 
holding a banner which says rescue our peers in Syria. We have to think about it because in social media it was very striking and now although there is war conditions there and it's the eighth year of conflict the young and the youth still pays the cost for this war so what should we do to tackle to address these problems and what solutions we can create for these young people how can we save them and how can we have opportunities out of these problems lebanon we have borders between Lebanon and Syria, and with Palestine and Syria. Although we are a small country, we are welcoming the refugees. And especially for the Palestinian refugees, we still have Palestinian refugee camps and tents in Lebanon. And still in conflict, people come to Lebanon from conflict areas. So this is a, a chronic problem in Lebanon. After the Palestine war till Syrian war, we had this problem in Lebanon. As peoples of Lebanon, we are putting every effort to support the refugees, but the Syrian crisis has been protracted and we have problems in Lebanon. We have more than a million and a half displaced Syrian registered in the Lebanese state. And for them, the crisis resulted in a systematic deterioration of their rights, quality of life, level of education, and medical care, as well as future prospects for their children and youth. They are deprived. Now, they suffice it to say, ladies and gentlemen, that the war in Syria has told the childhood and youth of millions and affected their long-term physical, psychological, and mental health. All these children and youth are not seeking politics and know nothing about but their innocent childhood after having lost their homes, schools, communities, parents, relatives, and possibly their future too. We, in our towns and cities in Lebanon, willingly welcomed our displaced brothers. We welcomed in... It is a form of returning the favor for what the Syrians did during the constant Israeli attacks on Lebanon. We welcomed them in our homes, in our educational system, in our hospital and social services, and we shared everything with them. But with the protraction of the war in Syria, some towns and cities faced increasing tension due to the doubling of the population, which put a lot of pressure on all services, and despite the presence of municipalities in the front lines about the tackling of this crisis, the Lebanese municipalities lacked the necessary support from the central government to meet the needs of displaced Syrians. Also, the very few guidelines that define the municipalities' powers has led and in varying degrees to different local responses depending on political affiliations of the municipal councils and local socio-political characteristics. As municipalities, we have taken actions based on our instructions of the Ministry of Interior because, as you know, the municipalities follow centralization system. Even though the ministry knew that some municipalities have overcrossed their legal powers, the absence of policies has created chaos due to the different standards and decisions, and we see this in the different measures adopted by the municipalities. What we have done in Safaran municipality is to seek better conditions for displaced families, most of whom were children, women, elders, and some youth who were living in a state of confusion, alienation, loneliness, and dispersion and their sensation that they were uprooted from their communities, dreams, friendships and lifestyles and thrown into new communities with new customs. Also, just like in other regions and countries, their history and their relations got scattered between capitals, camps and refugee programs. So, how can we not apologize to them and try to offer something? So, we try to make them forget, in some cases, an alienation beyond their alienation from their homeland, and we try to empower them and integrate them in the process of building communication bridges to offer them some hope in a decent living. 
On the other hand, many associations and institutions in Lebanon have tried to create a balance between Syrian and Lebanese youth. And as a municipality, we have applied our work based on this balance. However, as municipalities, our authorities do not allow the employment of Syrians except in the fields of agriculture, construction, and hygiene. And according to the laws, we cannot allow the practice of self-employed professionals like medicine, engineering, law, and others in their domains. And despite that, we work with the civil community to respond for the youth's needs. Even though the Syrians are being blamed for the deterioration of the economy and the competition with the Lebanese worker, they are considered one of the most important drivers of the economic wheel. Faced with the most of these challenges and believing in the youth, we, as Safaran municipality, we have acted with the available and limited resources on initiatives. We have covered for the love of humanity wherever it is, awareness workshops, psychosocial support for youth and women under the main headings, disadvantages of marriage of minors, mental and sexual health, gender, gender equality, the importance of investing energy and capacity for development. Participation and networking with local associations supported internationally to prepare accelerated vocational training courses for youth and from the Lebanese and Syrian communities to achieve integration amongst them and to enable them to have a profession that allows them to enter the labor market. Regular dialogue sessions for women and youth problems and solutions, allowing these people to express their sufferings to help them change for the better. Partnership with the Ministry of Social Affairs, which work on empowering and promoting the concept of success among youth. We have two cases, two examples. A Syrian refugee was seeking work. We get him in a job in a making chocolate boxes, and he started working for 700 per month. Later on, the family, then he involved his family and neighborhood, and they made 7,000 per month when they started working as a community. Another example is when we paid a household visit, a Syrian family, we have come across with a very young girl, and her parents died during the war. She was an exclusive voice. She had an exclusive ex special voice. We provided her guidance and training for a potential future to achieve her dreams. The participation of displaced Syrian youth and women in many of the activities carried out by the municipality, including artistic, sports, social, educational, and recreational activities, and joint participation in preparation, discipline, and others. Participation in many community activities. Finally, most of the displaced, displaced Syrian youth suffer from lack of affection, lack in self-confidence, and many of them wonder in their memories talking about war and dead people images. So half of these assistances and supports go to supporting officials and paying their wages. Instead of these uh, administrative costs, we shall establish a factory and we will employ these refugee children, women, and population in these employment opportunities so that they will have an employment opportunity. And this could be a contribution to their economy. When we pay these foundations and NGOs, half of this money, money goes to administrative costs to pay the officials' wages or for studies, desk studies. If we establish a factory for employment, that would be better for all, and thank you very much. It's hosting uh, the refugees from different countries, including uh, Palestine and uh, Syria, and also the challenges that you're facing, you know, municipalities facing between national policy and local situation. And I'm, um, I'm impressed by your experience in Provi instead of isolating the refugees, providing inclusive approach together with host communities. Now I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, Mr. Emer Arisoy, the mayor of Zaytinburun municipality, Istanbul. The floor is yours.
Çok teşekkür ederim. Thank you very much. I would like to extend my thanks and congratulations for those who organized this forum. And I wish that this forum will yield fruitful results for our country and for our migration policies. And also, I greet all participants. I'm coming from Zeytinburnu of Istanbul. Zeytinburnu is just next to the historical peninsula, and it's a historical district city. Our migration experience started way before this flux of migration from the dissolution period of Ottoman state. This Zeytinburnu district was established through migration. Therefore, our migration experience dates back to many decades, and we have studies. Previously, I worked for 15 years as deputy mayor of Zeytinburnu. Therefore, I have an institutional memory of Zeytinburnu for 20 years. And being punctual, I will try to summarize the activities we had so far for today. We have around 50,000 migrants and 25,000 are registered Syrian refugees. And due to irregular migration, the exact figure, all institutions working on migration, but it's constantly changing every day and every week. These figures change because due to irregular migration. All activities related to migration in Zeytinburnu is carried out in an umbrella institution and it's a family, women, and disabled persons support center, ACTEM. As I said, we are a district established with migration and we have significant studies about migration. One of those significant studies was the one we conducted in 2005 and International Migration Forum, and it still serves as a reference resource. That symposium, it was published. The uh, results of the symposium was published in two languages, and it was way before this flux of uh, migration. But Zeytinburnu rec was receiving already migration from all around the world. Later on, as a EU grant project. We have implemented a project for developing capacities of local authorities, and we paid working visits to other um, municipalities in different countries. And also, I skipped just one thing. I couldn't change the slides, this symposium. This, I told about it, just arranging the slides. We had a festival for migration movies. And together with the residents of Zeytinburnu, we had a new blend of activities. And we conducted, implemented a project for developing the capacity of local institutions for integration of the migrants. It was an EU project for developing the capacity of NGOs in our district. And another EU project was for settlement of refugees, an EU project. I'll just skip. We organized a composition, an essay competition, and it was a painting and essay competition for children at school, and the title was Being a Migrant in Another, in a Foreign Country, so that the people could dream and empathize with each other. Side-by-side -side project. We implemented this project with an NGO called IS Foundation, and same window project and from seed to trees project, another project, child protection project. I just skipped them by naming the projects, and I'll go with our current studies. As I said, ACTEM, the center for the projects, is the umbrella institution for our activities. And we have a service for integration to city. In the previous session, it was discussed. Regular Turkish language courses are carried out. So far, around 1,300 children and around 2,000 adults learned Turkish in our courses. And for education and psychosocial supporting of children 6 to 14 
age group, we have an harmonization school and we give trainings to children in 6 to 14 age category. And we have migrant women's club. And migrant women coming from different countries share their experiences and they socialize. We have many activities and we have a project titled Car Search, you see, which can be translated as Snow Sparrow, and it is for increasing the employability of migrant women. And the first phase of this project was awarded. The second phase is continuing. In our integration to city services, we provide constant guidance and consultancy in multiple languages. And we have routine and regular seminars. The incoming migrants to facilitate the integration of migrants to the city and to address the challenges that they face in integration and to support their psychological well-being and resilience. We have the Save the Children project and the second phase is going on. Social activities are very important for us, not just from Turkey. We have migrants from Turkic countries and from migrants from African countries and their dialogue with host communities and the residents of the city. We have many activities for fostering that dialogue. I'll just skip the activities. We have coordination meetings with NGOs and legal advisory and legal consultancy. As I said a while ago about property ownership, they have problems about property ownership, and we provide legal consultancy to migrants. This car search, is it, this Snow Sparrow project, this is to increase the self-sufficiency of the migrant women and their economic independence, Save the Children project. This is the second phase of the project, Save the Children project. Resto project, we have discussed with the officials, Marmara Union of Municipalities and Swedish local authorities institution, and we have very significant outcomes and outputs, and they are reflected in our strategic plan. We have another project for human rights, and we co-implement it with a foreign partner to save some time for Q&A. Briefly speaking, these are the activities of Zeytenburne. I tried my best to be punctual, and thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Quite important in, in your work, closely working with civil society, enhancing social cohesion, while addressing also the barriers that refugees are having through psychosocial, legal, and other practical support is quite, quite remarkable. I would like to invite next speaker, Mr. Carlos Mascarel, Coordinator Task Force on Refugees and Migration from CMR. The floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I will present a slightly different perspective because as you can see from my title, I do not work in any municipality. Uh, I work for CMR, which is the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. It's the association at the European level grouping all associations of uh, local and regional governments. So TBB, in the case uh, of Turkey, uh, the Union of Turkish Municipalities is our member. And we basically try to influence EU legislation in all those aspects that have an impact at the local level. In this case, uh, we work on refugees through this task force composed by members, uh, by members of our associations. And we also provide a bit of knowledge exchange platform to, to our members so that they can learn what each other are doing. I'm saying this because I, we've listened many presentations about very concrete local practices, and I will focus a bit on how to translate this into something that can turn a bit more structural in the way that we scale up practices, because still we repeat a lot coordination, uh, partnership, uh, multi-stakeholder platforms, but still there is a way to go in order to have something which is a structural in place in order to assess what can be changed at the regulatory level and also at the policy level in all levels of government as a result of assessing which local practices work and which local practices do not work. So, first, the, 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 uh, migration is a very fragmented field. 
So in this case, we know that asylum is very uh, is a central competence, but then, of course, uh, migrants live in, in cities, so it is municipalities giving shelter to, uh, to, to, uh, to migrants and to refugees. There is a difference between economic migrants, between brackets, if, if I, even if I don't like the word, and refugees, because they are entitled to different rights. So first, we should already start seeing which are the difference from these people, which are the practices for ones, and which are the practices for the others. Um, all this uh, brings me to, 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 to assess that in Europe, what we have done now through the urban agenda for the EU is try to find a, a model in which at the continental level, we can find a way in order to improve regulation, improve funding, and improve knowledge exchange. Uh, so the urban, through the urban agenda, we have created several thematic partnerships, and one of the thematic partnerships is on the inclusion of refugees and migrants. And the interesting thing of this partnership is that it is composed by the Commission itself. So what it would be, in, I know that in other countries, the continent is not as integrated as in Europe, and of course, directives at the European level have a much more impact at the local level than in other uh, continents. But the, the good thing is that you have the commission there, so the director general responsible for migration. You have individual cities. You have associations or networks of, of cities, some individual cities, I said, and also some members of, of civil society. And all this sort of multi-stakeholder platform, we work together in order to improve regulations, checking what was happening at the European level and at the national level in terms of the uh, regulations that existed. Uh, also, uh, which funds existed, how we could improve, try to fill in uh, the gaps, and also what uh, sort of uh, knowledge exchange mechanism we could reinforce in order that each other knows better what to do and that the those legislating at the end, the central government could provide through funding and also changing regulations a better framework in order to uh, scale up those practices which work at the local level. This is, seems, in terms of governance, very obvious, and we have listened here many, many initiatives, but I still find that there is a bit of disorder in the structures and how we translate from which institution, if we think about the, the, the global governance of migration, we have the global compact of refugees, we have the global compact of migration, we have UCLG working on this, we have the mayoral forum, we have the high level political forum. All these structures need to be brought together because the idea is to translate what we do here in order to be improved at the international level and then brought back down in order to improve even more the, the situation. So I think that the European model shows that this has been working, it's the first experience we have, and we see that there are directives at the European level, but also at the national level, that are being improved for local authorities because all the stakeholders were present in the table. And I think for vulnerable groups, in these cases, the session we are working here is a bit the same. I think at the whole layers of government, so at the global level with the umbrella organizations, then at the national level with the national associations, uh, NGOs working at the national level, uh, regional governments, a series of cities, not only big cities, middle-sized cities, big cities and small cities. There should be a structure in which we repeat for every topic the same structure. Uh, because this is the only way afterwards in order to have a proper scaling up of these practices. And I would put a very concrete uh, example if we think about, I don't know, um, uh, women integration. There should be a national agenda on urban matters in which there is a partnership working on, uh, in every country, in which there is a partnership working on integration, and there is a subgroup working on gender equality in which all actors are involved. And the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Employment, the Ministry of, uh, of, uh, of Equality in certain countries should be involved in all these urban national urban agenda partnerships um, in order to uh, be able to discuss with local authorities what works and what doesn't work, and then try to bring it at the national level in order to change legislation, if necessary, according to the competences, of course, and also try to find which funding programs uh, work. There is a whole bench of principles. We do not have time to, to present them them here, but uh, I think that also for migrant children in this case, and one of the actions, by the way, of the partnership on the inclusion of migrants and refugees of the urban agenda of the EU is on unaccompanied minors and youth. And what we have achieved there, for example, is doing piloting projects in which we blend 
fin financing mechanism between the European Investment Bank and also the AMIF, Asylum Migration and Integration Fund of the EU, in order to create guardianship systems which facilitated the transition between 18 and uh, adulthood. Because we found that there were, there were many problems in many cities and many countries when youngsters move from, uh, from teenage ages in which the uh, state is obliged or municipalities are obliged to protect them. When they turn 18, they are simply, if there are no places in shelters, if there is a not pr proper integration, they simply feel unprotected. So this was an initiative that we uh, took under the, the partnership of, of refugees, this piloting, through blending mechanism, which by the way, at the same time, is an idea uh, for, uh, for funding in, the, in this case. And I, I'll, I'll stop here and then maybe in the discussion we can, uh, thanks. Thank you very much for sharing the act, um, actual practice from Europe. And as you rightly said, all the declaration, discussion, and output best practice challenges need to be shared in a structured way and in, without systematic mechanism. All the outputs and outcome will not be useful and then it will be not sustainable. So I think your suggestion and your proposal is quite important as one of the output for this forum. Thank you. And I would like to invite uh, Ms. Elise Bjorg Christian Dutier, the Emergency Coordinator of UN Women, Lower East Years. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the, the organizers and uh, to my previous speakers and uh, very impressive stories you've been sharing and uh, good examples of, of positive efforts on the ground. Um, as the, the focus of this, this uh, conference or forum is to look at the local solution. I've been working in the field of migration for, I think it's embarrassing to say, I think it's counting 16, year, 16 years now. And uh, it's, it's, I, I, I think I can be, uh, uh, the local community is taking the largest share of the responsibility in most cases globally. And it's very important to, to host such an event where people can join forces and share experience and et cetera. And uh, I've had the, the honor of working in Turkey, although I'm based now as a regional uh, migration and humanitarian advisor for Europe and Central Asia. I was prior to that, I was based in Turkey for two and a half years. So I came I, in May 2017 to work um, for UN Women to build up a res gender responsive approach to the situation and the context here. We've been working very closely with the local government, for example, here in Gaza and especially. So I want to mention, because I know that there are uh, a lot of Turkish people in the room, but there are also a lot of international people in the room, is that coming to Turkey two, year, two and a half years ago, and until this day, I am very, very impressed by the approach of the municipality, the, the, how they tackle the situation, how they, the, the both, both the hospitality and welcomingness, but at the same time, balancing that with responsible actions and, and et cetera. And this, I, I want to use the opportunity to say, because um, I've also had the honor of listening to, to them in other conferences, in, in events, and I think there's a lot to be learned from the approach here, as well as I know there's a lot of know-how and experience in, from Europe and other countries in the room today. Um, as you might know or might not know, women and girls are disproportionately affected by conflict and crisis globally which means that not only are they often harmed, more harmed than men and boys, but they often also have different needs. And it's very, has been challenging for all actors globally to, um, to respond uh, to the needs that, uh, that the women and the girls are facing. Uh, we as young women have been, uh, as I mentioned, working in, in Turkey and other countries globally to, to strengthen the, the, the uh, the general, the overall response, as mentioned, as my colleague from Ukraine or the mayor from Ukraine mentioned, it, one of the tools that we have been using, and it was very happy to see that you were sharing examples of the gender responsive budgeting, is one of the very few tools, uh, but very important tools that can be used. Because uh, why do we need to better support women and girls? It's uh, by supporting the women, by, um, we're not only making them stronger, but we are making the whole fam family stronger, and we are, uh, uh, they, be they can become not only leaders, but active agents in the society that can become crucial for the local community, 
whether it is in the short term or the long term. So I wanted to show this picture on the, the wall today. And the reason why I'm selecting this picture, this is a picture of uh, Syrian women based here in Gaziantep, is because most often, while, while I'm saying that women are disproportionately affected, they're harmed and they go through severe challenges, both whether it is natural or man-made conflict and crisis, at the same time, with little and minimum support, this is and can be the outcome. Women that have been facing multiple um, challenges, trauma of war, gender-based violence, sexual violence and assault, and etc., domestic violence, child marriage, etc., that are the same women that you can see on the screen there with the minimum support. Uh, and if, if they are properly, I think the picture is gone, um, they can be a key actor in any response on the local level in working with the, the, the municipalities and all the actors on the ground, they can become the key actors in that. So um, since 2016, just to give you an example, we, you and women in Turkey um, carried out a comprehensive need assessment of Syrian women and girls, executed in seven cities around the country. Uh, the second big uh, effort that we, the, we, we are very proud of is the launch of the SATA Solidar Empowerment and Solidarity Center in Gaziantep that we are running in partnership with Gaziantep Municipality, as mentioned before, International Labour Organization and the Association for Solidarity on Asylum Seekers and Migrants. Initially, the center was supported by the government of Japan and Iceland, but since early 2018, it has been strengthened and activities expanded outside of Gaziantep with its generous uh, funding from the EU Regional Trust Fund. The establishment of women's safe spaces is a part of an overall refugee resilience and response programming carried out by UN Women worldwide. Our approach with the center is to offer a holistic approach to gender sensitive refugee response by combining extensive outreach, psychosocial support and referrals, childcare, economic and social empowerment, and support to social cohesion. And just to give you one example of a positive outcome from this initiative, uh, and an, an initiative where local and international actors join forces in supporting and empowering women, in March 2019, SATA Cooperative, emerging from the SATA Women Empowerment Center, was established by 50 Syrian, Turkish and Afghani women in the context of the program mentioned earlier. The SATA Cooperative is an inclusive, inclusive business initiative by refugee and uh, local community women providing a collective income get generation mechanism for crisis-affected women. Earlier this month, not only was some SATA Cooperative selected as one of the top 100 initiatives at Paris Peace Forum, which clearly confirms the great success of the project, but was in the end selected as one of the top, top 10 scale of projects during the Peace, Paris Peace Forum and is now receiving global attention. I just wanted to give you this as an example how you can turn the, 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 the challenging results of crisis and conflict into something positive that not only strengthens the women, their family and the local community, but can, the whole the society can benefit from but is uh, one of the initiatives that is as a result of using the gender responsive approach to uh, efforts. So thank you. Thank you, Elise, for elaborating on the multiple challenges that the women face in the migration and displacement. Also, also the positive example of the how we not only victimize the women, but also to change them as an active agent for peace and sustainability and hope. Now, last but not the least, I would like to invite Ms. Nure Karola, the president of CADEL. The floor is yours. Herkese merhaba. Ben de söz... Hello, everyone. First, I would like to extend my thanks to national and international organizations for organizing this, and also to the Metropolitan Municipality of Gaziantep for their wonderful hospitality. And as previous speakers of the session uh, emphasized, uh, I would like to extend the positive approach and great experiences that they shared. As you might know, Monday this week was the 25th of November. 25th of November is International Day for Fighting Against Violence Against Women. 
And this week is an awareness uh, activity week. And it's a coincidence that this forum and this session is on this meaningful week. And we hope that after 25th of uh, November, we will not forget it on the 1st of December and 3rd of December, and we will focus on these women issues. We know that this day, this week, this month, this many women have been killed. We wish that we will never have, ever have these bitter experiences because it's the basic right to life for all women to be free from violence, and it's a fundamental basic human right. 3.6 million people from Syria are in Turkey, and half of this population are composed of women and children. So I will analyze it on the basis of women uh, glance or women perspective to migration. And our title is Gender Equality and Achieving for Everyone. This is an inspiring ideal, but for all humanity and for all we need this ideal. For whatever reason it is, migrating from one place to another place are experienced differently by men and women. Today, it's a widely accepted fact that women and men experience migration differently. Today, while we are aspiring to travel to another planet, on the other hand, people are being forced uh, displacement and they are deprived of their basic rights. And this is a humanitarian drama. And people that we convene, that we come together here is a reflection of our sensitivity. During their migration, women suffer from physical and sexual harassment and attacks, and they fall victim to human traffickers. And during the migration and after migration, women suffer common challenges due to being a woman for gender-specific problems. And these challenges and problems, as mentioned by previous speakers, is domestic violence to sexual harassment, exploitation, and difficulty to access the women's shelters to uh, avoid shelters, and eliminating the barriers to access to education and health, language barriers, early age marriages, and forced marriages. These problems are not just for migrant women, but even the resident and the nationals of the countries, just because of their gender, gender it's a cross-cutting issue for women. As Kader, an NGO, throughout the 22 years since our establishment, we have encouraged the equal and full participation of women to decision-making mechanisms, and we are fighting for that. We put our efforts to make it possible for women to have a life free from discrimination, because we believe that when women are represented equally in uh, mechanisms, in political mechanisms and decision-making mechanisms, they can develop their solution mechanisms with a gender perspective, and they can touch the lives of the women. And touching the lives of the women, as emphasized by previous speaker, it will not just improve that woman's life, but it will improve that family's life, and in a broader sense, the social welfare. Being gender responsive is an awareness in itself. Few uh, uh, attendants to this session show their sensitivity and the attention that they pay to gender equality. Thank you very much for your participation to the session. When we look how to solve the problems at local level, the local governments and municipalities and the residents of these cities, or as the people who are forcedly displaced or the migrants, we have expectations from the local governments. We have two perspectives. Mostly we have mayors here for two days, and I believe, please accept this uh, uh, definition. The mayors are suppressed and they are in between serving the host community, meeting their needs, and on the other hand, to address the basic needs of forcefully displaced people or migrants, and maintaining a fine balance between these two whole communities, and not to cause a hate speech. For local governments, these are significant and critical barriers, I believe. 
the public policies are implemented through budgets and that's the half the public policies change the lives of the people while drafting the budgets if we have gender responsive budgeting then the residents of Dallas cities the people benefiting from municipal services and their experiences are different their needs and demands are different so due to differences in their gender they have gender specific needs if we keep it in mind we make budgeting without needing additional resources because we have scarce resources all mayors and local authorities know but the service domain is indefinite with uh, limited resources you try to provide indefinite services and you have to have an optimist attitude and approach without bringing additional burden on the budget only through gender responsive budgeting we can address the needs of just gender specific needs and we can create healthy solutions we call it an example of a violet and a cactus the purpose is two different plants and you grow them in your garden or in your home it's the same a violet and a cactus and you try to uh, keep it if you give cactus that much water as violet it dies or vice versa they have different needs of water so gender have such specific needs and they have very distinct distinctions between their needs for going out at st on streets at night time, the safety and security of the city for women, or equal access to opportunities and education, besides forced displaced and migrant women's language barriers. If you cannot speak the language of that society, you cannot be expected to integrate and harmonize with that society. But local governments, to provide services, the local governments open language courses, and many local governments have this awareness. But another example here, we say, and this is a true story of a municipality, based on a true story, an example, a case by a municipality, that district, considering their needs and they made a wonderful investment and a sports complex sports center was established and after a certain period of time they had an assessment to understand how profitable and efficient used by and they come to conclude that male use it more frequently and they ask the question why women refrain or why women benefit less or almost never benefit from this sports complex it turns out uh, it reveals a reality they never considered these women have children at home and they are care providers to children and elderly at house Somehow the elderly can be organized and alternative caregivers can be given, but for children. Based on this need, that local government, when they open a kindergarten or a nursery facility in that sport complex, they see that women benefit more. Therefore, very much like it, opening language courses and vocational courses is not sufficient. Yes, it's a good step, but we need to be data and uh, information based assessment at what age these women are what is their marital status do they have an employment do they have children and how many of them could benefit from these services we should have a gender responsive perspective we have limited time here and i'll keep it brief as Kader ngo we have activities for gender responsive budgeting with municipalities and with an academic institution, we have a scoring study for municipalities. We have more than 200 indicators for scoring the municipalities about gender responsive service provision. In each of these more than 200 indicators, what is the perspective of that municipality for gender equality? And the book and the findings of this study will be published soon. And we have a manual for preparing and drafting integrated uh, strategic plan let's think of a local government additional waste by migrants is one million ton per year and it's 700 billion cubic meters additional water use 
to provide all these basic services. We are, the NGOs are fully supporting local communities, local governments. The meetings are very important, but implementing and realizing the outcomes and findings of these meetings and symposiums is more important. Turning them into concrete action is very important. As an administrator or a manager of an NGO, I would like to make this call. Finally, I will quote from Ibn Haldun, a philosopher. Ibn Haldun, famous and known, it says, geography is your fate. Your geography is your fate, maybe, but we are there to change our faith and shape our brighter faith. Thank you. Thank you. Highlighting the key role that women can play in decision-making process, which was not pointed out so far, and also the actual um, practice of in highlighting importance of data and information. And I think that was also mentioned in the, in the plenary session of mayors that we need narratives because the challenges the women and youth are facing are not only specific to the, those migrated or displaced sometimes. Sometimes the women and youth in host communities are having the similar challenges. So um, in relation to that, I would like to um, highlight that this point that the, of these common challenges that the, both host communities and those migrate, the youth and women are having. Um, I, you highlighted some of the good practices of addressing the issues in both. But uh, do you have any additional uh, good practice that you can share? Uh, I know that there are common challenges, like for example, early marriages, it's also um, common problems that the uh, refugees of Syrian and also the host community in Turkey are having. But um, if there's any um, example of that from the municipality that they, you, of the, the, the actual practice that you're addressing it together with host communities. And also perhaps some, uh, some example from the Europe. Since no one is taking the floor, I just want to give example that from all our efforts in Turkey, for example, we all our efforts is a combination of the Syria uh, the women, Syrian women, Turkish women, and from some other uh, refugee population here in Turkey. And we emphasize this, and I know that is a common effort in Turkey to uh, to to focus on both because if. You have efforts uh, that are only focusing on the refugees and excluding the local community that can feed into social tension and uh, create problems for the society. So this is something that we highly uh, recommend and, and uh, have been doing here. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, yeah um, I think what it shows a bit what we've been discussing that we need an integrated approach. We cannot work only on uh, child marriage, for example, or on youth isolated. So I think there is a chain of causality. You can have a very good cluster of, for example, working with mosques, working with uh, police, working with uh, social agents, working with uh, councils or participatory councils of women or of youth, uh, with the municipality itself, with the private sector. But if you do not have a job, if you do not have a house to stay, if you are isolated in a neighborhood where you do not interact with the host community, all those elements are connected. So uh, th this is important because if not, uh, we, we risk to work in a very interesting project uh, to fight child marriage, but then we miss a bit the, the big picture. In this case, there are several examples in, in Europe in which we try to, in, in at the municipal level, but also at the national level, there is, for example, the city of Mechelen in, uh, in, in Belgium, which is very well known for its integration policies, in which you have very specific clusters for vulnerable groups in which people working on those areas are involved. So, for example, uh, in, in, in the field of, of youth integration, you would have all these services of the uh, municipality working on that. You would have also, including some uh, services at the European level, because it's very close to, to Brussels, so Solidarity Corps, this is a European program. You have also the youth platforms working with youth people, and all these clusters are repeated 
fit in all the different vulnerable groups and also areas. For example, for housing, you have one cluster, you have one cluster for education, you have one cluster for, uh, for um, housing, I said it, well, several, uh, several um, uh, clusters. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do you have any comments from the, from the mayors? While addressing the question, you said it. This is not just a migrant problem. This is not a problem specific to migrant women. It is also true for host community women. I tried my best in my presentation to state it. Our support and assistance to migrant population is inclusive for host community. There is no separate venues. They are conducted in the same uh, facility because to avoid any sense of isolation. Therefore, our host communities, whichever services we have for awareness raising, psychosocial support, or legal consultancy and advisory, we provide the same for migrant women. We have no discrimination between us community and the migrant women, and we provide the services in the same facility, he says briefly. And of course, the refugees and women changes in rural areas and the urban areas, because in rural area, you have some problems in rural areas. Because they stay in camp environment, in tents, so that social cohesion is more difficult in camp environment or in tents, because they are not together with host community. And there can be some religious or sect-related issues. Some people marry their children at child age, at early age, to protect the honor of the child, so-called, and they have a religious perspective and attitude for this child marriage when they have an intercourse, an extramarital affair, when they have extramarital affair. There is even killing of girl children, girl child. To prevent these honor killings, they try to marry them at a very early age to prevent so-called forbidden extramarital relations. We need awareness raising about them, sensitizing activities. They are extremely conservative families. They have limited information and access to information. You have a problem with uh, divorce, uh, divorce women, uh, because many people who went uh, to uh, Eastern Ukraine uh, were divorced. Uh, and that's why we have problem, and uh, we have problem with work, with uh, houses, flats, and that's why and children, and that's why we uh, try uh, to solve this, uh, those problem uh, with our social uh, department and another uh, um, local authority. Uh, authorities and many uh, problems uh, we have with uh, family when uh, one uh, woman uh, is Ukrainian uh, and uh, man is from Muslim countries and many, uh, unfortunately, many uh, families uh, are divorced uh, and uh, we have many problems in uh, society and many problems with uh, social uh, responsibility in our city. Uh, but uh, those problems uh, are not uh, a big problem for our uh, city and we have a strong uh, team uh, who uh, work uh, to involve women uh, to start uh, enterprises and to start uh, education uh, in uh, different uh, uh, kinds of uh, our economic. Uh, that's why we have uh, a good uh, examples to solve uh, those problems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, as we are running out of time now, I want to move to the Q&A session. Do you have any question? Okay. Um, so maybe so. The first, so we have two audience. 
Yeah. Kindly in, uh, identify yourself yes, with yes, your yes. name. Uh, my name is Edith. I am from UNDP. I have two questions to two people. Uh, first one is to Ruslan Marcin. Thank you. Sorry if I cannot uh, mention good. Uh, you mentioned about the entrepreneurship uh, programs, and I wonder the sustainability of these uh, programs because. We know uh, in Turkey and uh, in the world, uh, women are very much encouraged for the entrepreneurship uh, issues. Uh, do you have any data? Do you have any monitoring mechanisms? How many of them are sustainable and how many years they can continue to work in this issue, uh, uh, as entrepreneurs? Uh, Second question is to Mr. Ömer. Yes, you are conducting wonderful programs and it's about sustainability i would like to ask when these project-based activities and will these committees and programs continue after the expiration of the project period what is the sustainability and we have uh, 14,000 entrepreneurs in ivano from kiev and uh, good tendition that uh, more than 57 percent uh, women and we have uh, two big programs uh, and uh, we have uh, programs in crescent and opportunities for women of an economical life of one of Kiev city and investment literacy for women and uh, we have uh, statistic and we uh, many women uh, want uh, to have and, uh, knowledge uh, and education uh, in our uh, business center and our uh, university oil and, oil and gas uh, technology. And that's why uh, we have program and thank you for program ProOn and uh, Canadian uh, partners uh, who support uh, us uh, to realize uh, this program. Thank you. For the question addressed to me, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to further explain. Sustainability is a critical issue. Here, I couldn't go into all the details of these projects. We have the Karser Chesi, the Snow Sparrow project, and it's in the second phase. At the beginning, these supports, project supports, is the first step, and it's the most challenging part to start the project. Now, after completing the second phase, we will have a trained and qualified human resource and the infrastructure and equipments available. And in this project, the textile products, we will have a brand for it, and we will commercialize textile products of this project and we can ensure its sustainability. You might have realized all our uh, projects, all our activities have partners, both domestic and international partners. Through these partnerships, we will make it sustainable. And it's very true that the project-based activities will be like a bubble, soap bubble, and we will provide some microfinancing supports for sustainability of the projects. And thank you very much for providing opportunity about sustainability of the projects. Um, unfortunately, we have to close the session now, but uh, I would like to thank all the speakers, um, especially I was impressed by the uh, mayors stating that the refugees are already isolated once from home, and we should not isolate them again. And each mayor and each agency, you are highlighting the importance of inclusive, inclusive approach. And actually, this uh, challenges that gen uh, women and youth are having could serve as a good opportunity to promote social cohesion. So, and also, I think it was key, uh, essential to highlight the importance of uh, coming up with a mechanism to share these practices instead of uh, finishing it as a one-time exercise. And then in this regard, some of the good example from uh, Turkey, setting the indicators and providing systematic information can be useful. And I think this is something that uh, this forum should take it for the future proposal. So I thank all the distinguished speakers and the audience for the productive discussion. Thank you.